wasn't expecting you here today. <laughs> you can't get enough of this book either? Well, it is a great way to unwind and relax. Okay, well I guess we can get started. Oh, I missed you too, you're so sweet. Rite of passage. A queer calm comes over me. It's clear that for whatever reason, my parents are not able to come back. I am on my own. To survive until help arrives, I must rely entirely on myself. This birthday is not about evening gowns, dressing up, play acting. It's time to stop fooling around with childish games and superficial nonsense. Start acting like an adult whose life is at stake. Childhood is over. Scissors. Braid. Inhale. Cut. Chop. Until short spikes bristle all over my head. I coil the long braid in my hand. It feels alive. I wrap the braid in my mother's silk scarf. Tuck it into the vanity, under the mirror, out of sight. I look down at the dog. Time to get serious. Change of strategy. I stayed close to home all this time, certain someone was coming to find me, not wanting to miss them when they came. Now staying alive is top priority, even if it means going beyond the neighborhood. There's no telling when my parents will return. There's no telling when my parents will return. There's no telling when my parents will return. If I say it a lot, maybe I'll start to understand it. The days are cooling off, getting shorter. I need to think about the immediate future. On hikes, Dad always harped on how fast the weather changed in Colorado. How we needed to be prepared. With no electricity and no furnace, I need to plan for what could be a cold, lonely winter. It always snows before Halloween. There's no time to waste. Hunter, gatherer, on patrol with George. Our eyes are open for a coyote. Nothing. Abandoned cars sit in the market, supermarket, parking lot, like islands in the middle of an asphalt ocean. People pushing carts of groceries will emerge from the gaping doors at any moment. Inside, skylights provide dim illumination, smells of rotting food, urine, feces, impossible to breathe. George's nose twitches, fur on the back of his neck stands at attention, hair rises on my own arms. A toppled display of cookies and cakes, plastic boxes chewed open, contents eaten, overturned, candy racks, half-eaten wrappers. The dogs have been here, eyes straight ahead, hands on cart. Navigate around dog mess. Try not to breathe. Five jumbo jugs of bottled water. Three cases of canned dog food. Dog treats. Chew toys. Canned fruits. Canned vegetables. Canned chili. Canned spaghetti. I don't bother leaving a note. I've stopped thinking in terms of imposing on others' property. I think only of survival. Ant. Not grasshopper. It takes forever to get home, pushing the big, heavy shopping cart and stopping to rest along the way, but by visiting the store every day for a week, I'm able to restock the pantry with plenty of food for me and George, as well as the dragon enough. Water and juice and energy drinks to last through several bl blizzards. I unpack the last load of supplies and park the empty shopping cart around the east side of Mom's garage. I exhale. <sighs> Exhausted from winning a race, I didn't even know I was running. Heat. I've made a critical mistake. No wood-burning fireplaces on Lake Drive. The houses are designed with modern gas-operated ones that turn on and off with the flick of an electric switch. Useless. They don't even have chimneys. No fire. No heat. No heat. No way. We will survive a Colorado winter. We have to move. Dad's house was an old-fashioned wood stove in the living room. We often use it in winter to help heat the downstairs. 
But Dad's place is an old town, twice as far as the trek from Mom's neighborhood to the supermarket. The shortest route involves walking around the lake on gravel trails that will not be easy, pushing a shopping cart full of supplies over and over again. Without heat, we'll freeze. Without food, we'll starve. It's running. It's already getting colder every night. Time is running out. We have to move. Plan B. 30 yards down the lake path towards Dad's house, the full shopping cart bogs down in the gravel and won't roll. Rocking makes it worse. Rocks jam the wheels. Riding back and forth with a bike trailer would be faster even though it can only haul a fraction of what's in the cart. Back to Lake Drive. Mom's minivan looks at me from the driveway. Do I dare? What if I can't even manage to back it out onto the street, let alone make it all the way down to Dad's house and back? What if I get in trouble for driving under age? I'd better dare there. Will be more serious consequences than illegally crashing an abandoned car in an abandoned town. I shut George in the house and take the keys. Driver's Ed. I unlock the driver's door and grab my bike helmet and climb in. Safety first. I buckle my seatbelt across my lap and click my helmet strap under my chin. I turn the key, surprise and hallelujah. The engine starts. The gas gauge points to a third of a tank. I grip the steering wheel, try to slide the gear shifter into reverse. It won't move. I try again. It stays put. Surely it isn't supposed to take this much force. There must be a trick. Think. Why would it stay in park? What's the advantage of that? Safety first. I press my foot on the brake pedal and try again. The gear shifts easily into reverse. I whoop a victory whoop. I ease my foot off the brake, and the car begins rolling backward down the driveway. I turn the wheel and overcompensate so the rear end of the car backs up onto the front lawn. Pushing down hard on the brakes throws me backward in the seat, and the car stops abruptly. I sit for a minute, choking on my heart and my throat. At least it's facing the right direction now. I keep my foot pressed on the brake, slide the gear shift into drive, and inch down the street. I circle the block four times before I feel confident enough to risk George's life too. I pull back into the driveway and start loading up the van. Define home, anyway. I used to change houses every Monday, homecoming, coming home, routinely reunited with one parent, routinely separata separated from the other. A member of the divorced nomad club making the weekly switch according to the custodial agreement. This is different. Mom's new modern neighborhood three-car garage. Cold. Dad's 100-year-old farmhouse heirloom rose bushes. Warm. Empty houses aren't home. Wood stove. I've seen Dad light fires many times, but I didn't pay close attention. Never done it myself. Last thing I need is to burn the house down. I've got to do research before evacuation I had my computer. So now, think. Before Google, before Wikipedia, before internet. Come on, George, we're going to the library. Millerville Public Library. Front entrance is locked. I try every other door, but no luck. In the back of the loading dock, I find a basement entrance next to a tall, thin window. I choose a heavy rock from the landscaping and heave it. The sound of shattering glass shocks the silent town, and I jump, forgetting for a moment there's no one to chastise me. No reason to feel guilty. I reach through pieces of jagged glass and unlock the door. Inside, we make our way through the dim light up to the main floor in rows and rows of books. We pass the children's section where I spent hours making crafts and singing along at Sandman's story time. We pass a bank of computers, all dark, and an entire section of CDs, DVDs, and recorded books worthless without power. In the main section, eastern light from a big bank of windows illuminates the stacks. I walk down rows, reading labels on ends of shelves. Fiction goes on forever, and then magazines and newspapers. Finally, nonfiction, but everything's organized by random topics, and numbers on spines don't make sense. How am I ever going to find a book about how to light a fire? Okay, George, we're going to have to go row by row and check every shelf. I'll start over here, and you start over there, and let me know if you find something. George wags his tail and follows me. Books about knitting and crocheting, gardening and building, birdhouses, sailing and travel, history and politics. 
Finally, a small section on camping. No books about lighting fires and wood stoves, but one with a chapter about building and extinguishing campfires. I tuck it under my arm and head for teen fiction. George trots along beside me. We browse novels until we're armed with enough reading to last several weeks. Jandy Nelson, John Green, Elena K. Arnold, Jason Reynolds, Lori Hulse Anderson. In a state of emergency, there's no limit on the books we can borrow. Outside the service door, we surprise a feral cat sniffing around the bike trailer. Her angry hiss startles me and I jump and drop my books. George tells her who's boss and she dashes off. We load up our treasure and head for home. Thank you, Laura and Gulls Wilder. I won't take survival for granted, and I have no intention of being stuck in a long winter with no fuel. My driving improves, I still wear my helmet and seatbelt every time. I fill the van with firewood from my neighbor's yards and load it into high stacks on the front porch and around the side of the house. I read the camping book cover to cover and practice building fires in the stove. I scavenge a case of matches from the store and seal the boxes in plastic baggies. They have to stay dry no matter what. I debate driving east out of town looking for others or the edge of the evacuation. But how would I get gas? What if I ended up stranded and lost somewhere? I remember all the little house stories where people took chances in winter and almost perished in the cold. I could die in a blizzard far from home. Dad's voice echoes in my head. Stay put. Stay put. Stay put. Five and a half months. Occasionally, on the crank radio, I pick up a signal from a town in a state far away, but more often than not, all I find is static. When I do find a station, I listen for any mention of that em imminent threat or any plans to end the evacuation, but I never learned anything beyond what I heard the very first week. Often I lie in the dark at night, wondering if what I'm hearing is pre-recorded. Nothing ever sounds current or specific. When I let the radio fade, the night noises mix with the static in my head. My ears strain against the silence. Hungry. Darwin. Trapped in the corner of an alley between a garage and a dumpster, a rabbit shrinks, trying to be as small as possible. Three dogs bark and growl. I ride briskly in the opposite direction, but I can still hear the rabbit when it screams. Winter Storm. Freezing rain and wind take the last of the leaves still clinging to the trees. Snowstorms streak all night in the house's shutters. I push and drag my mattress into the front room, snuggle with George under layers of quilts, warm and cozy by the wood stove. We keep other doors in the house closed to contain the warmth. I melt snow to wash, use bottled water to drink and cook, treat myself to hot cocoa and my stepmother's favorite blue mug. To pass the time, I play solitaire like my grandma does with cards, spread across the ironing board, lowered down in the front of the recliner. I sketch portraits of George, I read library books, I ask trivial pursuit questions, and try to guess the answers before I flip the cards over to see if I'm correct. I pull out Dad's chessboard and play against myself, rotating the board at each turn. I watch the snow pile up in the yard and marvel at the magic. Winter still works on the world. Whew. Man, I don't know. This, I guess it's just because like how calming and how much it unwinds me lately when I'm reading this book that it just makes me want to take a nap. <laughs> Winter refugees. Whether my, whenever, wherever my parents are and whether or not they know by now that I was left behind, there's surely no hope of rescue while winter is in full force. Roads will be impassable and airports abandoned. We're ghost, George. Ghosts in 21st century ghost town. Short days, long nights. Following each storm, the sun emerges and melts the snow enough to make venturing out possible. I need to save gas, and I'm afraid of driving on icy roads, so we explore the town on foot, check neighboring houses, look for food and firewood. Mostly, though, days are cold and dim. We sleep a lot, conserve batteries and propane, even though I think we have plenty to last until the roads melt and clear. I feel superstitious taking anything for granted. I read all the library books I borrowed. I invent a new card game using three decks and a pair of dice. It takes several days to win. I browse the books on my parents' bookshelves, read about how to tune a piano, what really caused the breakup of the Beatles, the causes of Shuklo Slovakian theater design. 
I study Jennifer's field guides, choose my favorite wildflowers, imagine hiking across the meadow with my family, I fantasize picnics on mountainsides, make imaginary deviled eggs, sprinkle dill and paprika, top each one with a caper, I can taste them on my tongue and feel warm granite under me. But I learn to be cautious with my fantasies. They can lead to an ache that begins deep in my body, fills my torso, crawls down my limbs until I can no longer feel my hands or feet. Sometimes longing combines with despair and leaks from the ner- marrow of my bones, swirls into my blood, permeates my muscles, invades my entire body. When that happens, it takes all my strength to crawl into bed and curl up, wondering if I can make it through another frozen day still alone. Christmas. I drag boxes of ornaments up from the basement, hang shiny balls along curtain rods, light the Swedish Christmas candles, watch heat from the flames rise, little wooden angels spin around in a circle, choose more books from the library and a watercolor kit from the craft section of the local drugstore, wrap them, decorate with ribbons and holly, find a special rawhide bone for George and tie a big bow around it, I make Christmas dinner, turkey soup, canned cranberry relish, canned squash, box cornbread stuffing with dried apricots, canned apple pie filling. After dinner, we open our presents. Sing Christmas carols, Silent Night makes me cry, so we can switch to Santa Claus's coming to town. Sit by the fire, George gnaws his bone, I paint his portrait, think about a holy family alone in the strange land, wondering what their future holds. Trust. Each day I brush snow off the front porch, lay out a row of sunflower seeds. I sit still and quiet at the end of the porch. Squirrel comes down from his nest in the cottonwood tree, collects each seed one by one. As the days pass, I make the row closer and closer to me. One day, the row leads to a seed in the palm of my hand. Squirrel gathers the seeds, run back and forth up the tree to deliver his treasures. When he reaches my hand, he pauses, grabs the seed is up the tree again before I can blink. Every morning after that, he comes right to me, eats breakfast out of my hand. Snow falls, melts, falls again. The wood pile grows smaller on the side of the house, so I teach myself Clementine, and you are my sunshine on Dad's ukulele. I sing songs to myself, tell George stories about handsome dogs and brave girls. Making art. I spend one whole afternoon searching through magazines and catalogs for someone for images of people, use my art knife to cut out photographs, combine them into different bodies, different settings, different families, shellac them onto a cardstock and fragments of broken glass. I hang the installation from the chandelier over the dining room table. Air currents move the family slightly on their strings, but they never tangle or cross their meat. One morning, I unlock the front door, let George out, a spot of color on the ground, a bright purple crocus peeks out of the muddy snow. Over the next days, more crocuses holler up from their winter beds. We count and greet each one. Then yellow daffodils, followed by rainbow tulips, up and down the street. By the time the irises send up their spiky stalks, spring is official and a new sense of hope blooms in my heart. Oop, it's a whole new section when we meet up for our next little book club thing. It'll be peril, grave risk, exposure to injury, loss or destruction, danger. It's also a noun. But I could pass out. Mm. Couldn't you? Hmm. No, maybe. I think so. But I need to go and print off some scripts for some customs. <gasps> yep. And I need to record, record, record. And probably eat some so I don't feel like I did yesterday. I felt like I was gonna pass out yesterday. It was bad, it was really bad. I don't know if it's cause I was dehydrated or cause I like didn't really eat. But, like I didn't feel like I was hungry and I didn't feel like I needed to drink anything. But, like when I stood up, that's when I felt it, it like really hit me.
and I just felt off for the whole day. <sighs> well, thanks for coming over for the reading. You're so, so sweet. I appreciate you. Oh, I have my foot on my own face. My bad. Sorry, pillow. Once again, you can get my pillows in the store merch. Link is, the link is in the link tree link in my uh, description of the video. Much love. Bye, have a wonderful day.